AAP Human Geography students, we are uh, moving on to Chapter 6, Key Issue 1 and 2 today, and so we will be looking at religions. And so our big two questions that we have, where are religions distributed, and why do religions have different distributions? And we're going to go through things kind of quick, uh, kind of some basic information here about the religions first. All right, so let's take a look here. Uh, we're looking at how religions are classified. We have universal versus ethnic religions. And so universalizing religions are kind of more like pop culture versus folk culture here. So when we look at universalizing religions, we look at Christianity, Islam, Buddhism. They tend to be more widely distributed. Um, and so then we look at the ethnic religions, and we look at things like Hinduism, Judaism, Confucianism. And we'll go more in depth on what that means um, and, and the universalizing versus ethnic as well. One mistake that AP Human Geography students often make is uh, misidentifying uh, Judaism as a, a universalizing religion. It is an ethnic religion, right? But uh, Judaism is widespread uh, through, not through, through circumstance, right? And then identifying um, Buddhism as a universalizing religion, right? Or as an ethnic religion, it is a universalizing religion. It is it is widespread and it is designed for people across time and space. And that's the big difference between you got to know the difference between uh, universalizing and ethnic religions. Key component here. As you can see, we also have religions being broken down further. Uh, specifically, universalizing religions tend to get broken down further. We look at branches, denominations, and sects. And so we're using some of the Christian. Uh, examples here, different branches. There are three major branches in Christianity. We look at different, all kinds of different denominations once we get to that point. Um, and then we have sects, which is sometimes controversial, but that's a, a small group of followers in a religion, essentially. And that may grow into a denomination. It may eventually become a branch, um, but that, that's kind of the, the three levels that we have for, for breaking it down. Here's kind of a quick uh, breakdown of the world religions here, the major world religions. You can see we've got our ethnic religions over here. We've got a large population of people who are becoming more non-religious, and that's something that we're seeing uh, growing quite a bit in the world today. And then you've got your, your big ones over here. They're breaking down Christianity into Catholicism, Protestantism, and Orthodox, which are your branches. Uh, we've got some other Christianity in here. We've got uh, Islam being broken into Sunni and Shiite. And then we've got other Islam, and you can see Buddhism, so our major ones, major universalizing religions. So we're looking at about a, quarter, a third of the world being uh, Christian, about a quarter of the world being uh, Muslim, right? You got ethnic religions, and then keep in mind you got the secular world is the word that we use for non-religious, right? You're going to hear that word secular coming up right now. So green slide, looking at secularism, and we're talking about the rejection of indifference of for, or indifference, excuse me, of formal religion. And so that's what we were just talking about. There is a rise in population of people across the world that are becoming that non-religious category there that we're talking about, secularism. Um, and so it's developing a lot more in MDCs, which makes sense. Uh, we send, tend to see ethnic religions focused uh, in LDCs and newly industrializing countries. So MDCs is where we start to see more people becoming this, uh, this idea of sec or having this idea of sec secularism. Uh, so you can see kind of our numbers here too. Here's another one for you, looking at kind of the causes and the effects of secularism. So it could be something like a political policy of a country. Um, it could be something about just people being dissatisfied with the, the religion itself, specifically the church, in this case the Catholic Church, and some of their policies. Um, and when we look at the effects, it, it changes things. We start to see uh, secularism increasing in MDCs, and it devalues the importance of religion in those MDCs. And you don't uh, remember a time when, when things were not open on Sunday, right? Very few things. Chick-fil-A would be the, the exception to that. Chick-fil-A is closed on Sundays, right? Because uh, the, the CEOs come from a, a fairly religious background, right? But shopping is open on Sundays, right? It generally is. It might be shortened hours. But uh, back in the day, you know, 30 years ago, um, you know, most things were closed on a Sunday. All right, so we're going to kind of break down the three major universalized religions first. We're going to go quick. So we look at where is Christianity distributed. There are 2 billion followers of Christianity around the globe. All right, this is the number one most, uh, most populous religion around the globe. There are three major branches, as we said, Roman Catholic, Protestant, and Eastern Orthodox here. And you can see where those distributions are. Um, and there are some other branches that are isolated. Obviously, we see a lot of people in, uh, in isolated areas of Africa and Central Asia as being um, Christianity, uh, having aspects of Christianity. We also see the Latter-day Saints in the United States as being another uh, another branch that's kind of isolated from these others here. And there it is, your distribution. So again, we can see it's pretty much global. Uh, there are areas where we have below 40% population that are Christian, but 
again, pretty much across the globe, it is a universalizing religion. Notice the effects of colonialism, right, in Africa. Definitely. Then we look at the breakdown in the United States, and we're looking at uh, more into denomination here as well. So you've got the Bible Belt area we always talk about, the Baptist area here. Um, you can see we've got a lot of Catholicism across the country here. And then we get, if you look at the north, we've got Lutheranism, and we've got some others in there as well. The, the colors are kind of close to the same, but this is supposed to be Latter-day Saints over here. Um, it's just tough to tell on me with the light bulb. There's another example there. When we look at breaking, breaking Christianity down here into its different branches and uh, denominations. Right? Within the United States, again, we look at, at all of this, right? And, and if, you, if, we, if we keep uh, the, the denominations together, right, mo all of this is Protestant, right? And that is Roman Catholic. So uh, th this map, the, the map that we have from before, will, will give you the illusion that there's a lot more Catholicism uh, than there actually is because they don't break Catholicism down by uh, denomination because there really isn't a whole lot of denomination in, in Catholicism. So keep in mind that this is a bit of an illusion uh, you know, that, that we're, we're much more Protestant, right, than this map would appear. Man, you'll learn much more about Protestantism and Catholicism next year in world history, too. Absolutely. Big, big for world history, right? Next one we have, guys, is Islam. When we look at the distribution of Islam, there's about 1.3 to 1.6 billion followers of Islam across the globe again. So it's the second largest universalizing religion, a lot of which is in North Africa and Southwest Asia. They have two major branches, Sunni, which is about 83% of the population, and then Shia, which is about 16% of the population, and most of them are in Iran or Iraq. Um, and so we look at that, we're seeing growth in North America, we're seeing growth in Europe, and we've been talking about that with migration and, and other aspects of, of class too. Now keep in mind that we always see the, the, the Muslim world, right? North Africa and Southwest Asia being dominated by Islam. You see it in the, in the, in the everyday along the cultural landscape, you'll see you know, mosques and all that stuff. But, right, remember, that Indonesia is the biggest country when it comes to total number of Muslims, right? Pakistan and Bangladesh are packed with, you know, they're, they're Muslim, they're Muslim dominated countries, right? India has 200 million Muslims, right? But they remember they have 1.3 billion people and it's dominated by Hinduism. So, you know, they're, they're a minority there, right? And watch the politics uh, and what's happening with, with uh, right now, currently in India with their current president and, and they're going after Muslims, right? There's, there's a little bit of religious unrest happening right now. There's your distribution. So we can see the areas that are 80% or above. Is what we're talking about that Arab world, the, the Muslim world there, and then we get into some, some of these other areas where we're seeing high populations as well. Even though they have a lot of Muslims in India, like Sharon was just saying, it's still below 20% of the population because they have such a large population, right. obviously. Mm -hmm. So where is Buddhism? So our last of our three major universalizing religions here, there's about 400 million adherents to Buddhism across the globe, specifically in East and Southeast Asia here. Uh, there are main, three main branches. We're not going to go super in-depth on those, but when we look at it, uh, it's really difficult to measure Buddhism and, and where people are and how many people are Buddhist because Buddhism works really well alongside other religions. So they may have an ethnic religion that they adhere to, but they also practice Buddhism as well. And so that it's, it's very difficult to measure how many people are actually Buddhist because they might not report they might say hey I'm, I'm Taoist right when they're actually practice Buddhism too right because it's not it's a non-exclusive religion and there's your distribution of Buddhism the areas where we see the most and we also have uh, Sikhism on here as well that's in there it's that's very, very right small there, part right? yeah right in the Punjab region of India is where <laughs> the Sikhs hang out and so Buddhism, we'll talk a little later about hearts and things. It starts in here and kind of spreads into other areas of, of Asia here as well. Take a look at ethnic religions uh, and how they're distributed here. Hinduism is uh, the world's largest ethnic religion, and it is very much contained in India here. Most people in India are going to fall into that category of being Hindu. Uh, so 900 million followers, almost all of them, like we said, live in India. We look at Confucianism and Taoism are both... Uh, are, are both religions in China, Korea, and Japan. Shintoism is a Japanese ethnic Almost religion. exclusively in, in, in there as well. Yep. Judaism uh, also falls into the ethnic religion category here. Uh, and again, it, it talks about the origins of monotheism, um, which we get into with the Hebrews uh, later on. We also look at that in the United States, Israel, and Eastern Europe being the major places where we see Judaism today. And keep in mind that Judaism is a tiny religion when it comes to this, you know, the seven plus billion people in the world, right? Um, there's, there's very few um, actual people who follow Judaism, right? 
Um, but it is the origin of monotheism, right? It has it has ties to, to other things, and and it's been widely you know it's widely distributed compared to other ethnic religions. So it's an exceptional religion. So you're going to hear a lot more about it than you know can, in terms of uh, other religions that might have those numbers. And we're not going to really talk about. It also has very important ties to two major universalized religions, Christianity and, and Islam. So we'll talk about that a little later too. We also have animism, um, tribal areas of Africa, South America, Southeast Asia. We see things like animism or shamanism. So it's, it's that's a catch-all term. It means a lot of different things. So there we are looking at the percent of Hindu here population in the world. So again, 97, 90% right here. It says in India. We can see some of our other percentages here in Southeast Asia or South Asia, I should say. And then we have our Taoist or Taoist population, 96% being in China. Notice that Taiwan, right, is China as well, if you ask the Chinese government, right? So 98, really. Really, yeah. Yeah, depending on who you ask. And then we look at our Jewish population. Again, that's a little bit more widespread. You can see in 1910, much more widespread. Obviously, things happen after that. The Holocaust is eventually going to happen, and we see a major change. And then they create Israel, which we mm -hmm. talked a little bit about the other day with, with uh, language as well. So the creation of Israel is going to change the distribution population here of people who are Jewish. Again, shifting times here in Africa, too. So you can see the traditional religion in 1900, and then we start to get into even more uh, colonialism here as well at this point, and we see much less traditional religion right. present. Also keep in, in mind that universalizing religions recruit, right? They're going to go out. There's missionaries, right? And so they're going to be spreading the good word of their religion. Uh, and, and so you see that effect from 1900 to 1990. Well, and you can see that effect in 1900 to 1990. It's the same area that's the same color up here. It's the 10% or less, basically, and that's part of the Muslim world. They, right. that Islam had already, had already gotten there in 1900. So. There's your world religions. Probably tough to see us on there right now, so we'll keep you catch that slide some on your, on your uh, school of Yep. Yeah. What are the origins of Christianity here? Looking at, uh, kind of going quick, obviously the origins, everything comes back to uh, Jesus. Uh, Christ, who is kind of the origin of Christianity here we look at. Uh, the followers believe that Jesus is the Messiah or the Savior. Um, then we start getting into the three branches here, Roman Catholicism, Orthodox, and, and Protestantism. Uh, and so the, we have the, the Pope being kind of the head of, of the Catholic Church here, and the seven sacraments being very important. Uh, Orthodoxy, we get into to the Roman Empire after the collapse of the Roman Empire. It's a shift to kind of the eastern portion of the Roman Empire. And then Protestantism comes out of the Reformation movement in the 1500s. This is a man right here, Martin Luther, uh, who kind of creates this movement at the time. So Christianity becomes uh, starts off as one church, right? And then it splits between Roman Catholicism and, and Orthodox after uh, the fall of the, the uh, Roman Empire, right? And then in the 1500s, there's a, uh, there's a split in the Catholic Church between Protestant and and Roman uh, and Roman Catholicism, and you'll get more about that in the Reformation, right? All of that uh, next year in world history. So, looking at the origins of Islam, uh, again, it can be traced through Christianity, can be traced through Judaism. Those three religions are all very closely linked. Uh, and we look at the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad in the 60, 600s, uh, the creation of the Quran, which is supposed to be the Word of God written down by Muhammad, uh, and it all starts in Mecca, Saudi Arabia, the holiest city there. Over time, there's been a debate uh, over who's going to be the, kind of the successor after Muhammad, and that led to a split. That's where we get Sunni and Shia branches of Islam. Most of the world is going to be Sunni, right? It's Shia is, is very uh, specific in, in, uh, in its distribution. And in Buddhism here, we look at the found, founded by Siddhartha Gautama here, the Buddha. That is the original Buddha. Buddha is a title, but he is the Buddha. And uh, we look at his teachings, emphasize selflessness, emphasize meditation, and, and kind of what he called the Eightfold Path, essentially. Non-material, right? Very non-materialistic. So it doesn't really catch on in the United States, because we like our stuff, don't we? Right? right? We like our, yeah, all kinds of things. So if we look at how did universalized religion spread, these are our hearths here, you can see. All right, There's Christianity, right? Spreads there, spreads to Europe, and then eventually, through colonialism, spreads to... Uh, everywhere else. Yeah, Latin America, the Catholic Church, all of that stuff, right? Here you have uh, the Muslim world, right? You have distribution. And keep in mind, that goes all the way up into Spain, right? And, and gets Eastern into Europe, Europe, right? That, that these are, at some point, uh, you know, Muslim places. 
um, and you see the spreading there. And then again, note that Buddhism, we think of this as being an Eastern religion, and it really is today, but it started in South Asia, right? In India and Nepal. And so looking at the diffusion here of, of some of these religions, we just kind of went over the basic idea here at the hearth, obviously, for Christianity falling into what they call Palestine here, and today in present-day Israel, and over time spread through missionaries, through uh, contagious diffusion, as they call it, through relocation diffusion, and then later on through hierarchical diffusion. So Christianity takes all those aspects it's of to know. diffusion, definitely. Yep. So I would hit those for sure, relocation, mm -hmm. contagious, hierarchical. Yep. Looking at Islam... Uh, similar uh, similar spread here when we talk about the diffusion. Uh, they were organized. The followers were, were organized into armies. They called them, and over time they spread through trade and through the sword to different parts of uh, the world. Here, so you can see starting off in, in Mecca and working its way both east and west um, through uh, conquest, through trade, and all that other aspects here. There's our diffusion of Islam. There you have it. Good. Green slide for him. Sure, do you want to grab, grab the green slide? Yeah, sure. Again, we look at the diffusion of the landscape of Hinduism, right? So Hinduism uh, dominates the Indian landscape, right? You see it everywhere. It is infused. It is, is an essential component uh, to, to life in, in India, right? Uh, so again, it's an ethnic religion, right? So it's got, it doesn't have a small diffusion. You don't see there isn't a lot of Hindu temples, right, in the United States. It certainly can exist outside of, of India, but... Ethnic religions really don't, right? They stay, they stay put, right? So it dominates the landscape. You see temples and shrines everywhere. Um, you see, you know, holy animals. You see, um, you know, all sorts of different things happening. You see uh, holy uh, leaders, right? Um, that that exists, uh, you know, in India to a large extent. Looking at Buddhism and the diffusion of Buddhism here, uh, again, the hearth, we already talked about Northeast India, and again, usually trade is what is going to help this diffuse, and so we see uh, relocation, uh, diffusion for the most part, people are actually bringing it with them as they're moving from place to place here. Right? So trade being one of the big ones here, traveling merchants spreading this. There it is again, an example of the hearth, right? Again, keep in mind that it does not really exist in any sort of meaningful uh capacity in India, right? That it conflicted with Hinduism, and so it got pushed out, uh, you know, that the Brahmin uh, in India really did not, it, it clashed with with, uh, with philosophy, and so it, uh, it, it moves along. Uh, looking at some of the holy places here, universalized religions tend to be pretty widespread and have widespread holy sites as well, and so they tend to be linked to the life of the founder, a lot of times there will be shrines in those places, and people tend to travel to those spots. This here is the uh, the Great Mosque in Mecca. These are all people in the picture here. I know it's probably tough to see, but this is uh, the, the box or the building that all Muslims pray toward, facing toward. Uh, and so that is one of their holy sites there. The scale of the Great Mosque is, is amazing, right? It's so huge. If you can, yeah, if you can look at pictures online of, of, the, of the Great Mosque and, and the Kaaba there, it's uh, it's. Fantastic, right? It's really, really interesting. Green slide, looking at the uh, Chinese religious heart. Uh, we're talking about the Yellow River Valley and the idea that the Chinese philosophies of Taoism or Taoism and Confucianism are, are kind of ingrained in the, in the people and the culture there. We also look at uh, Taoism or Taoism here being the, having the concept of feng shui. Maybe you've heard of that before. It's an art and a science of organizing your lifestyle and your space. And the yin yang, right, comes from there, right? The idea of, of harmony and balance in your Right. And when we look at Confucianism, again, you'll learn more about this in world history next year. It becomes really closely tied to the dynastic power system that they have there. You have to pass tests that prove you're a good person based on Confucianism to even be in the government. And relationships, right? It's all about relationships. If you're, if you're good with your you know, teacher, student, and, and parent, uh, uh, child, child, yes. Elderly. <laughs> Respect your elders. Yeah. There's some of the examples of the feng shui. Just get through this one. Yes, your star. Go for it. All right, so we got pilgrimages again. Uh, you know, sacred sites, um, and you know the, the the peak one there is Mecca, right? That Muslims uh, one of one of the five pillars of Islam is that at some point in your life, if you can, you're supposed to go to Mecca, right? And and go to uh, to take that pilgrimage, right? Um, it's not the only example. You have places like uh, Ayers Rock in. Um, 
in uh, Australia, you have Devil's Tower, which is uh, um, a sacred space for indigenous people. Um, but keep in mind, like, tourism is a, is a major issue. And right now, uh, Mecca is having huge problems with selfie sticks and things like that that is disrupting the flow and the, the sheer number of people who can get into Mecca and who are allowed to, it's really disrupting their landscape, right? Cell phones, um, things like that. And if you think about it, you have to win the lottery, essentially, to, to, uh, to get the honor of, of, of getting uh, on this pilgrimage. And so when you do, you're going to want to document it, right? Uh, but that is, it is, uh, it is massively affecting, right, that area. So again, we look at holy sites here, right? Buddhism has, uh, you know, eight holy sites. Uh, again, it's it's in the hearth uh, of India and Nepal, but not necessarily where Buddhists uh, hang out, right? And so they're all linked to the life of the Buddha, right? In Islam, they're going to be associated with Muhammad. In Christianity, you have, right, uh, you know, modern day Israel has has, uh, has Jerusalem, right? Has uh, holy sites in, in Jerusalem, uh, Bethlehem, things like that, places like that. Uh, Islam going to have Mecca, going to have Medina. Um, again, we look at the pilgrimage, also known as the Hajj, right? And then Hinduism, right? Again, that's an ethnic religion. You have the Ganges River, right? And the idea of cleansing yourself in the Ganges River. And that is a spiritual cleanse. It is not a physical cleanse because you're going to need a shower after hanging out in those polluted waters, right? And it's fairly filthy. But notice how it's very very closely tied to India. It's tough to, to go through and, and visit the Mother Ganges River in India already. Right. There's your holy sites of Buddhism. All right, so again, the, the birthplace of Buddha is right here in Lumbini, Nepal. Uh, if we look at some of the things that are uh, attached to his life, uh, it's where Buddha uh, attained nirvana, which is his enlightenment when he became the Buddha. Um, here's one that, when Buddha tamed a wild elephant. So these are all sites that, they, that people who are Buddhists would visit. Note the, the comparison to Christianity, right? We're assuming that you have, because you live in America, you have some sort of of vague notions, whether you're practicing or not, that, that you have notions of Christianity, you're more familiar with that than maybe other religions, right? There's a birthplace as a holy site, there's an announcement of his impending death, right? Uh, there's there's an ascending into heaven and returning to earth, right? Kind of your Easter story. So there's connections, right, between uh, founders of religions, right, and, and, uh, and holy sites, right, and holidays, right, as well. There's another picture of the Great Mosque, again, probably tough to see if you zoom in a little bit, you might be able to see it, but again, there's the Kaaba in the middle there, and these are all people lining the Great Mosque, lining the outside, all praying at probably the early call to prayer, which is about 5.30 a.m. Note the minaret, right, which is the, the tower, right, that is an architectural feature that you'll see in the Muslim world, right, it's, it's in that landscape. And there actually has been questions on the AP exam asking what minarets are, so yes. you might want to know what know they that. are. Yep. Here's the bathing rituals in the Ganges River. Again, yeah, not a very clean river, very, very, very polluted. And so, like Sheridan said, it's, it's definitely a spiritual cleanse. You're going to have to go clean yourself off. Yeah. Mind there's cremation is the, is the, is the death scape there, right? And how, how bodies are disposed, right? More about that in fire in 6364. Here's Jerusalem. I always like this picture. We've got three holy sites for three different religions here. In the foreground, you have the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which is said to be on top of the tomb of, uh, of Jesus. In the back here, we've got uh, the Wailing Wall, or the Western Wall, which is a holy site for uh, Judaism. And then up on top of the wall, we have the Dome of the Rock, which is said to be where uh, Muhammad ascended into heaven. And so all three of these holy sites literally are within walking distance, very, very close walking distance of each other. And you wonder why Jerusalem has become a highly sought-after territory and city over time. It's very much divided up for these religions or on that next year when we get to the Crusades. Right. Last thing, guys, this is really important. Zoom in on this. If you don't have an idea of this yet, I would take a look at We've talked about all these things that we've gone as we've gone through, but universalizing religions have specific uh, kind of outlining ideas here. Again, we've talked about them being tied to a specific founder and the idea that they, uh, the message is diffused widely. People understand it and, and recognize it widely. Um, it's not tied to a specific uh, spot or place. His followers, again, distributed widely, and their holidays are based off the founder's life, like Mr. Sheridan said earlier. Uh, when we look at ethnic, we're talking about the meaning in a particular place. Only specifically think of the Ganges River, right? Um, we don't know where they came from. We don't know who the founder is. They are old enough where we don't know where they started. And then we look at the content being focused, again, on landscape of origin and the place that it actually originated from, typically. And finally, highly clustered in one spot. Again, Hinduism is a really good example because we said... 
90 some percent, what, 90, 92 percent of people are all in India if they're Hindu. All right, so highly, highly clustered. And again, the holidays are not based on a founder's life. We don't know who the founder is. They're based on seasonal changes, climate changes, agricultural so practices. Think about Jewish holidays, right? They, they tend to focus on harvest uh, and, and planting, right? Spring holidays there. Yes. They're very much tied, though, not tied to American climate, right? Or European climate, but the climate of modern day Israel, right? Palestine region. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, hope you enjoyed uh, Chapter 6, Key Issue 1 and 2. Uh, keep on going, guys. Chapter 6, Key Issue 3 and 4, we'll get into some of the conflicts that erupt uh, because of religion. Right, take it easy. There you go. Hang in there. Be safe. Be good to each other.